So it's my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker for this morning, Daniel McCarthy. I know a lot of you are familiar with him from the old Ron Paul days. He was a vet of the, uh, I want to say 2008 campaign. Uh, of course, he was at the American Conservative for some time. He's a columnist at The Spectator. And now uh, he heads up uh, vice president of the ISI, the venerable ISI, and edits its modern uh, age journal, which we still get at the Mises Institute, which is really a pleasure to receive. Uh, ag again, he worked uh, on the Ron Paul campaign, and uh, he is, among other things, a, a great historian of the conservative movement itself, and a lot of us understand the idea of fusionism in the National Review sense of it. Frank Meyer and other people were trying back in the 50s and 60s to, to argue that liberty and, and virtue were not at odds, which I think most of us in this room would certainly agree with. But uh, if you fast forward to the early 1990s, there was a new kind of fusionism attempted uh, between paleo, paleo libertarians and paleo conservatives, and this involved uh, people around the John Randolph Club, like Thomas Fleming and Pat Buchanan and Murray Rothbard and Sam Francis. So, all that said, uh, there's a lot happening in the world today uh, politically, and we hope that our view of the world will have something to do with that. So, uh, please welcome Daniel McCarthy. Well, thank you, Jeff. It's a, uh, a great honor to address uh, the Ludwig von Mises Institute. And uh, one of uh, Murray Rothbard's most famous speeches, which in fact was delivered at the uh, John Randolph Club in 1992, uh, wraps up with the stirring uh, uh, commitment that we shall break the clock of social democracy. We shall break the clock of the great society. We shall break the clock of the welfare state. We shall break the clock of the New Deal. We shall break the clock of Woodrow Wilson's new freedom and perpetual war. We shall repeal the 20th century. <laughs> well, I'm happy to report that I think uh, our work is proceeding, and it, is, uh, it takes as much time as it needs to. Of course, if we've broken the clock, well, that means it's no longer running, and we can uh, set our own timetable. Now, uh, this morning, we want to stay on a fairly strict uh, timetable, however, so I will wrap up by 10 a.m., but I hope to leave some time at the end of my remarks uh, for question and answers, because I think uh, perhaps the most valuable thing I can contribute here is uh, some uh, responses to questions you may have about what is happening uh, politically and philosophically on the American right, among conservatives, perhaps among uh, libertarians to be found in other parts of the country, uh, including the uh, swamp uh, of Mordor in Washington, D.C., the, um, the right is really in a, a transformative period at the moment, and yet it's not the first time uh, that this has happened. And as uh, Jeff's uh, opening introduction uh, indicated, uh, there was a time when conservatives and libertarians tried to work together under the aegis of a philosophy called fusionism. Uh, there was also a time in the 1990s when uh, paleoconservatives, such as uh, Pat Buchanan and uh, the writers uh, grouped around the Chronicles magazine, uh, worked alongside uh, scholars from the Ludwig von Mises Institute in an attempt to basically set America back on a small r Republican path in the aftermath of the Cold War. The Cold War was a time when uh, even many people who had grave reservations about the welfare state and about the scope of government decided to set those reservations aside while uh, the Soviet Union was still in existence and there was a tremendous fear of communism. But at the conclusion of the Cold War, there was an opportunity for America to return to an earlier foreign policy, certainly, and an earlier view of its own way of life. Uh, unfortunately, uh, what had been hoped for by paleoconservatives and by libertarians uh, back in the early 1990s didn't happen. And instead, the 1990s and early 2000s became uh, sort of the golden age for neoconservatism. Uh, this wound up, of course, being uh, something of a, uh, a curse for the neocons themselves. It's the curse of Midas. What you touch, you think you uh, turn to gold. But in fact, uh, Midas found that he couldn't eat gold once he'd turned things into gold. And uh, the neoconservatives found that once they actually got the agenda they wanted, once they were able to invade countries like Iraq, once they were running up the federal deficit uh, and printing money, that uh, they in fact were unable to control the machine that they had unleashed. And uh, as a result, they wound up uh, discredited. And right now, we're seeing the aftermath of that, where there are new questions and new movements on the right in an attempt to fill the void that has been left by the collapse, thankfully, of neoconservatism. So let me briefly give you an overview of developments on the right among libertarians and conservatives, especially traditionalist conservatives, uh, those who are perhaps often seen as being at the, uh, 
sort of a farthest opposite side uh, of libertarians when it comes to uh, the role of the state or when it comes to the place of economics. A lot of traditionalists are seen as being uh, critical of economics, critical of free markets, uh, perhaps uh, in favor of industrial policy and tariffs, or perhaps uh, being um, principled or maybe one would say even romantic uh, agrarians who would like to go back to a much simpler economy and to uh, look uh, askance at an economy that is very much urbanized and uh, financialized. Well, let me begin my tale uh, in the years uh, shortly after World War II, and in fact, even uh, in the last few years of World War II, you saw a great revival of a philosophy which tended to be labeled by its own adherents as individualism. And of course, you had a number of great works published uh, in the midst of World War II, things like Memoirs of a Superfluous Man, Man by Albert J. Nock uh, in 1943, uh, The Fountainhead by Ayn Rand, uh, the Road to Serfdom by F.A. Hayek in 1944. You also had uh, books uh, such as Ideas Have Consequences by Richard Weaver in 1948. The idea of individualism that became popular and that many um, journalists as well as intellectuals applied to themselves was not necessarily strictly defined. And in many cases, individualism simply meant that you were opposed to the New Deal and you were also opposed to communism. And some of the opponents of communism were uh, very hawkish foreign policy anti-communists, but others were focused primarily on the philosophy of communism itself and its degradation of humanity and the need to uh, counterbalance and, and counteract the creeping influence of Marxist ideology by endorsing instead a set of ideas of liberty. So you had a figure such as Frank Chodorov, for example, who was a, a great libertarian journalist uh, at the, uh, uh, in the 1940s and uh, before. Uh, Frank Chodorov had at one point been affiliated with the Henry George School in New York City. Uh, Henry George was a tremendously influential uh, classical liberal, roughly speaking, uh, in the uh, late 19th and early 20th centuries. Uh, Henry George had some eccentricities. He believed in uh, a land tax, for example, and uh, he had it as a bit of a nostrum that was meant to fix a number of problems. But Henry George was basically uh, a committed anti-statist in other respects, and Frank Chodorov was a loyal follower of his philosophy. Chodorov was actually fired from the Henry George School in New York uh, because he opposed U.S. entry into World War II. So uh, Chodorov was a man of deep principle. And uh, in the post-war era, he wrote a, a column for Human Events, one of the leading conservative publications of the era, in which he said that if we want to stop communism, we actually have to teach freedom. We have to reach the next generation, and we have to give them a, a sense of the principles of our country, the principles of Western civilization, the principles of a free economy. If we're not doing that, if we abandon the field to the communists and the socialists, then we are lost no matter what else we do. And Frank Chodorov was uh, not a hawkish cold warrior. He was someone who used to say that uh, the answer to having communist infiltrators uh, in the federal government, communist in uh, government jobs, was uh, to abolish the government jobs. <laughs> so Frank Chodorov was someone who was, uh, you know, in many respects quite different from what became uh, the typical modal uh, Cold War conservative type. And in fact, uh, Chodorov always eschewed the word conservative. He preferred to be called an individualist. Well, one of Frank Chodorov's young friends was a recent Yale graduate by the name of William F. Buckley, Jr., and uh, Buckley also uh, had read Albert J. Nock, another great individualist. Buckley himself called himself an individualist, uh, especially in his first book, God and Man at Yale, which was published in 1951. And Buckley uh, had a Catholic upbringing that was quite strong. So he, uh, from the outset, had a blend of Catholic ideas as well as uh, libertarian or individualist ideas. Uh, he also, however, served uh, in uh, uh, the intelligence community, as we now euphemize it. And uh, that meant that he had very hawkish Cold War views indeed. And Buckley became, of course, a, uh, a formative figure in the post-Cold War conservative, I'm uh, sorry, the post-war, post-World War II conservative movement. So you had this uh, constellation of people who thought of themselves as individualists, and uh, they had a wide range of views on foreign policy. They were all critical of the New Deal. They were all critical of the philosophy of communism and of Marxism. Well, around the same time, slightly later, but uh, closely overlapping with the group I've just mentioned, were people who started to think of themselves explicitly as conservatives. And the word conservative back uh, in the 1940s and early 1950s was not one that Americans felt terribly comfortable with. And in fact, a number of um, liberal, modern liberal academics uh, were at this time uh, claiming that America had no real connection to conservatism. Conservatism was a European ideology. It was a, a kind of thrown and altar ideology. It was something that had no connection to the American founding. 
And uh, conservatism, you know, was, uh, as it existed in, in the United States, was not really a principled philosophy with any deep roots in this country. Instead, it was nothing but uh, irritable mental gestures that seek to resemble ideas, in the uh, words of Lionel Trilling, one of the great literary critics of that era. And uh, Lewis Hartz uh, became very well known for publishing a book called uh, The Liberal Tradition in America. And uh, he claimed that, again, America only had a, uh, a tradition of liberalism going back to the founding, and that it really didn't have uh, much in the way of a native conservative tradition. Well, in this era, in the uh, late 1940s and early 1950s, there is, however, a revival of interest among scholars in such figures as Edmund Burke, Alexis de Tocqueville, and Thomas Aquinas. And some of the scholars who are interested in reviving the thought of these figures uh, start to think of themselves as conservatives. And perhaps the most uh, notable of these uh, so-called new conservatives of the 1950s is Russell Kirk. Kirk, I should mention, is, among other things, the founder of the journal that I now edit, Modern Age, which uh, was launched in 1957. Uh, before Kirk did that, however, he uh, published a book in 1953 called The Conservative Mind. And in that book, he basically argues that contrary to Lewis Hartz and others, America did in fact have a true conservative tradition. It was embodied by such figures as, uh, for example, the Federalists uh, in the early part of uh, the American Republic. And uh, Kirk argued that uh, British conservatism, as uh, seen from figures ranging through uh, Edmund Burke to uh, Disraeli in the 19th century, all the way to um, uh, the American expatriate uh, T.S. Eliot in the 20th century, that English conservatism, Anglo-conservatism, had a deep connection with American conservatism. And this conservatism was um, not for Russell Kirk so much concerned about specific ideas and policies and issues as it was with an overall philosophy and outlook on life, a philosophy that was very critical of materialism, that looked instead to something higher and transcendent as uh, the goal of human uh, activity, hu both individual life and uh, our life in common, and a conservatism that um, had a very skeptical view of uh, modern science and technology, uh, mass production. Uh, Russell Kirk had uh, experience working uh, in the auto industry in Michigan, where he was born. He was uh, conscripted into the army in World War II, and he served in a chemical weapons proving ground in Utah. And Kirk saw the development of a kind of, not just mass production, but also a mass mentality among Americans in the early part of the 20th century that absolutely revolted him. And he looked to the conservative tradition, and he looked to figures like Edmund Burke, as a spiritual and moral alternative to the kind of uh, mass society that was developing in the post-war era and had in fact been developing even long before that. And Kirk tended to identify uh, what he disliked about the mass society with liberalism. And, and the reason for that was because so many of the political leaders of the early 20th century in America tended to identify themselves as liberals. And of course, they co-opted and they corrupted a term which earlier had a much more anti-statist meaning. In the early part of the 20th century, you find uh, figures like Woodrow Wilson and Franklin Roosevelt uh, increasingly using the term liberal as the label for their ideology. And their ideology is, of course, a very statist one. I should mention as well that um, what many people may have thought of as classical liberalism had also been discredited uh, in England by its association with a political party, namely the Liberal Party. And it was actually the Liberal Party uh, under um, Herbert Asquith as Prime Minister that led uh, England into World War I. And uh, Lloyd George, who was the last uh, uh, Liberal Prime Minister of England, continued uh, World War I. Uh, the spectacle of a liberal party, which previously had been in favor of peace, uh, being a war party in the disaster for all of Western civilization that was World War I, uh, was highly discrediting to liberalism in the UK. It was highly discrediting to the Liberal Party, which became a third party at that point in the UK. And it also had a spillover effect and uh, disillusioned many Americans with the concept of liberalism. So the combination of that and also the co-option of the term by the likes of Woodrow Wilson and Franklin Roosevelt uh, really created a backlash against the idea of liberalism and the label of liberalism, which is why so many of the uh, libertarian or liberty-inclined individuals and scholars in the uh, uh, 1940s, for example, and 1950s uh, styled themselves as individualists rather than as liberals. And it's why um, people like Russell Kirk and many of the new conservatives in the 1950s, they look at uh, the idea of liberalism and they associate it with uh, a great many evils that many classical liberals or libertarians would not associate with liberalism. That the label had become attached to a number of things through political parties and through political figures that would be very revolting with you know, high degrees of statism and of course uh, with World War I.
Well, the success of books like The Conservative Mind by Russell Kirk in 1953 leads to the label conservative becoming increasingly popular. So William F. Buckley Jr. initially uh, styles himself as an individualist when he writes God and Man at Yale in 1951. But by the time he launches uh, National Review magazine in 1950, uh, uh, 1955, he is starting to call himself a conservative. And many of his associates at uh, National Review are also calling themselves conservatives. I should say one other thing about uh, the fate of the term uh, individualist. So I'd mentioned Frank Chodorov a few minutes ago and how he was a, a sort of mentor figure and inspiration for William F. Buckley Jr. and how Chodorov had written a powerful essay arguing that if we want to have liberty in our future, we have to actually inculcate the ideas, uh, not only of free markets, but also of the values of Western civilization in the rising generation of college students. Chodorov was trying to counteract the influence uh, at, at long range of an organization that had started a couple of decades earlier called the Intercollegiate uh, Socialist Society. And so um, there came about uh, a, uh, a tremendous interest in uh, Frank Chodorov's effort. Chodorov wasn't really an organizer at this point. He was someone who wanted to be an ideas man, just wanted to write about uh, the principles of liberty. But he started receiving checks in the mail from people saying, we need to start an organization to carry out uh, the teaching of liberty to young people. And so uh, Chodorov went to you know, the young William F. Buckley Jr. And he said, you're a younger man. You can actually you know, sort of head up an institution like this. Buckley agreed to be at least a figurehead for this new organization. And so Chodorov and Buckley founded what was called the Intercollegiate Society of Individualists, or ISI. And uh, the ISI, of which I am now a vice president, is in fact the descendant of that ISI. Uh, we now are called the Intercollegiate Studies Institute, which goes to show how the label individualist fell out of fashion. But uh, the origins of ISI do indeed lie in the label of individualism. But again, even in the uh, mid-1950s, uh, so ISI was started in 1953, National Review was launched in 1955, and over the course of the 1950s, you find that the label individualist is losing ground to the label conservative. And this creates a certain amount of confusion. People like Russell Kirk, for example, are not necessarily very happy to see people who previously had identified themselves as individualists now calling themselves conservatives. And likewise, a number of people who had previously called themselves individualists are very uncomfortable seeing some of their friends now calling themselves conservatives, and as a result, uh, th uh, they themselves get called conservatives. It's, there's kind of a, a sense that there's mislabeling going on across the spectrum now. Some people who might properly be individualists, or what we would now call libertarians, are calling themselves or being called by others conservatives. And uh, conservatives and uh, libertarians who don't think of themselves as conservatives are both alarmed by this development. One person who tried to sort out this confusion was a senior editor at National Review by the name of Frank Meyer. And Frank Meyer had himself been a, 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 um, a communist at one point. A, uh, he was basically an agent of the, the Communist Party who was active on college campuses, recruiting young people, uh, basically doing the kinds of things that the Intercollegiate Society of Socialists had been doing, except uh, uh, Meyer was not just a socialist, he was actually a communist uh, working for the Communist Party. Well, Meyer had, uh, over the course of World War II, repudiated Marxism, repudiated communism. He had read F.A. Hayek's Road to Serfdom, and it had profoundly changed his life. Meyer came to understand the value of individualism and of liberty and of Western civilization. Meyer uh, went to work for National Review as a senior editor, eventually became the literary editor of the publication. And Meyer wanted to sort out the uh, confusion and the anxiety that uh, National Review readers and contributors felt about uh, the labels conservative and individualist and this new lab lab label of libertarian that was starting to arise at that time as well. So Meyer developed a philosophy which then gets yet another label. And uh, in fact, it is uh, a label that is applied by the conservative critics of this philosophy. So Meyer is trying to bring together uh, people who consider themselves conservatives, like Russell Kirk, along with uh, people who would label themselves as individualists or libertarians. And Meyer is saying all of these folks should adopt the label conservative. But one of the uh, sort of uh, hardline traditionalists, uh, who is a friend of Frank Meyer's, but also a strong critic of his, is uh, a fellow by the name of Brent Bozell, who is actually Bill Buckley's brother-in-law. Uh, Bozell is also a contributor to National Review. And within the pages of the magazine, there is a feisty debate uh, between Meyer and Bozell and, and other contributors about the nature of conservatism and liber uh, libertarianism. Uh, Bozell is very much on the side of the traditionalists who want to uh, maintain the conservative label and uh, basically not have uh, people like Frank Meyer call themselves conservatives. 
So Brent Bozell says that Frank Meyer's philosophy really ought to be called fusionism. Uh, because it is a fusion of libertarianism along with uh, parts of traditionalist conservatism. Now, how did Frank Meyer himself understand this? Uh, the answer to that is to be found in a book he published in 1962 called In Defense of Freedom, uh, still available from the Liberty Fund. Uh, Meyer said that uh, liberty must be the highest goal within politics, but that virtue is the highest goal within human life. And so uh, Murray Rothbard said that really, uh, in most respects, Frank Meyer's philosophy in politics, his political philosophy, was libertarian. And uh, he additionally had a conservative philosophy in life and in uh, society. But uh, fundamentally, Meyer was an anti-statist. The major uh, difference between Murray Rothbard and Frank Meyer had to do with the Cold War, where Frank Meyer, having been a communist in the past, uh, conceived of communism as being an existential military and subversive threat to the United States and to Western civilization. Uh, so Meyer was very much a, uh, a Cold War hawk, whereas Murray Rothbard tended to agree with uh, Frank Chodorov that in fact uh, there was more to be feared from an overreaction here in the United States, creating a, uh, a military industrial complex, as Dwight Eisenhower would call it, uh, in response to the Soviet Union, that the greater threat was coming from uh, basically within, from our country uh, adopting statism in response to the statism of the Soviet Union and the communist bloc. Well, Frank Meyer's idea of fusionism was not supposed to be a kind of Frankenstein's monster stitched together out of some limbs contributed by Russell Kirk's conservatism and other limbs contributed by uh, folks like uh, Frank Chodorov and uh, uh, Murray Rothbard and the libertarian individualists. Instead, what Meyer thought he was doing was to, uh, ironically enough, propound a kind of integral or combined singular idea of a unitary tradition, a unified tradition in the West of both liberty and virtue. And Meyer argued that this tradition of combined liberty and virtue was something that had characterized the Western tradition from the founding of Christianity all the way through to the end of the 18th century and the American founding. And Meyer believed that something tragic had happened in the 19th century, that this combined tradition of both liberty and virtue split. And instead you had different uh, people who were loyal to this tradition emphasizing different elements of it in tension with one another. So some people in the 19th century started calling themselves conservatives and started to focus on the traditionalist aspects of this tradition. They started to focus on uh, perhaps uh, religion and history and, and they became skeptical of um, market freedom and some of the ideas of liberty. And conversely, you had others who in the 19th century started calling themselves liberals. These were the classical liberals. And uh, in many cases, they were quite critical of religion. They certainly uh, were very skeptical of the way in which uh, religion had been practiced and institutionalized in state churches uh, up through the 19th century itself. So Meyer said that there was a tragedy that took place in the 19th century with the splitting of this singular tradition of liberty and virtue into two competing strains. And Meyer saw his task in the 20th century to bring these strains back together and to reunite uh, what had originally been a single tendency within uh, the developing uh, Western mind. And, you know, I mean, Frank Meyer certainly understood that uh, Western civilization over the course of 2,000 years uh, didn't always model either liberty or virtue, but rather he thought both liberty and virtue were the uh, innate tendency within the Western tradition as it had been worked out over the course of centuries and indeed two millennia. So just as you know, Western civilization had reached a, uh, an apogee with uh, the American founding and with the principles that were enunciated in the Declaration of Independence, that was the point at which you know, Frank Meyer thought you should have had the consummation of the idea of liberty and virtue being part of the same tradition. But instead, in the 19th century, tragedy struck and you had this division. So Meyer was uh, working assiduously to try to uh, make libertarians more conscious of the need for virtue in society and virtue in individual life uh, without necessarily adopting uh, statist uh, attempts to enforce virtue. And similarly, Meyer was trying to convince his traditionalist friends that uh, they should be anti-statist in politics, uh, but that did not mean they, were, they would have to compromise in any respect their uh, traditional uh, moral views in society and in individual life. And Meyer believed that liberty and virtue were not opposed, that in fact they went together, and that the self-responsibility that liberty imposes upon you, if you cannot externalize uh, your, you know, sort of, uh, your misdeeds onto the state, if you uh, have to take responsibility for yourself, for your family, for your community, then you will be, have to be virtuous, that virtue in fact is going to be demanded of you because otherwise uh, you as an individual and your family and your community will all fail.
Well, Meyer was not altogether successful in uh, persuading his colleagues at National Review of this philosophy. Uh, he continued to have critics such as his uh, friend uh, Brent Bozell. Brent Bozell was uh, a fan of what we would now call uh, Catholic integralism. And Bozell uh, looked with great admiration to Francisco Franco's Spain, not as a kind of ideal uh, political order, but rather Bozell thought that at least uh, Franco's Spain was a stepping stone to what he really wanted, which would have been a political order that was uh, more explicitly Catholic and that was willing to enforce uh, you know, Catholic social teachings and uh, you know, coercion in religion is something that you know, Catholics have always uh, you know, eschewed. Uh, at least that is the teaching of the church. But uh, the idea that you can have a social order where the state uh, provides every possible incentive for people to become Catholic and to remain Catholic, uh, that was something that Brent Bozell thought was not only possible but, and not only allowed under Catholic teaching, but was in fact mandatory. So Meyer had worked very hard to promulgate the philosophy of fusionism. And uh, unfortunately, it wound up being misunderstood many by, uh, by many of its own admirers, that fusionism came to be seen over the course of the 1960s and 1970s as a formula for a political coalition rather than being a philosophy. And uh, the political coalition that it came to stand for was one that may or may not be considered principled. Uh, it was a, uh, just a mixture um, of uh, conservative uh, social policy on the one hand with um, libertarian or at least quasi-libertarian free market economics, along with a very strong anti-communism and foreign policy hawkishness. This was not what Frank Meyer had in mind, but it was the way in which fusionism increasingly came to be understood. It came to be seen as kind of the default ideology of the Cold War Republican Party. Well, you had a, another group start to emerge in the 1970s who would become uh, very fateful and in fact very fatal for uh, a number of our countrymen. This group um, was the neoconservatives. They initially emerged as a set of intellectuals and journalists in response to what was called the New Left. And the New Left was uh, a, a breakaway from the old Cold War liberalism. The New Left uh, you know, was much more culturally radical than the Cold War liberals uh, such as you know, uh, JFK and, uh, and even Franklin Roosevelt had been. The New Left uh, you know, was kind of a predecessor to today's identity politics. Uh, it was very much on the side of uh, rioters and uh, criminals whenever there were you know, riots over uh, the draft and over uh, you know, uh, civil rights issues and whatnot. And uh, the new left was very critical of America's founding. Uh, they didn't quite have the ideas of the 1619 Project, but they basically were tending in that direction. They were very revisionist. Now, the new left uh, did have some uh, critical views of US foreign policy that libertarians and, in fact, certain anti-war conservatives uh, found uh, quite sympathetic. But usually the new left would take these ideas in a perverse direction. And it really was the case that for many on the new left, it was not so much that they were anti-war as when they looked at uh, things like the Vietnam conflict, they were just on the other side. They actually you know, were rooting for the communists and uh, they were not just uh, critical of America's in involvement in this war, but they actually thought that it was good to have revolutionaries like Che Guevara, for example, going around and starting conflicts in the name of a, uh, a worldwide revolution. The new left uh, tended to admire not only Che Guevara, but also Mao Zedong and uh, a number of other uh, radical leftists around the world who, of course, have uh, blood on their hands uh, to an incalculable degree. The new left was so radical that a lot of former Cold War liberals, these were uh, people who in many cases had actually been even farther to the left than uh, Franklin Roosevelt and JFK. Uh, in many cases, these were folks who in, um, uh, in their college days, for example, uh, flirted with non-Stalinist communism, in other words, Trotskyism. Uh, people like Irving Kristol, for example, uh, they uh, started moving to the right as the new left emerged. Uh, and the reason for this was they saw the new left as a threat to the Cold War project. Uh, and they also disliked the cultural radicalism of the new left. So the neoconservatives were not uh, sort of grounded in the ideas of people like Russell Kirk. Uh, the neoconservatives, in fact, really disdained people like the uh, Southern agrarians, these literary thinkers. Uh, they didn't like people like Richard Weaver. The neoconservatives also were not um, old style individualists or libertarians. The neoconservatives gave at most two cheers for capitalism. Uh, the neoconservatives really disliked uh, the idea of dismantling the New Deal and the welfare state. The neoconservatives actually thought that you could create a more conservative uh, kind of New Deal or welfare state. Uh, 
And this is actually quite different from someone like uh, Russell Kirk. So even though Russell Kirk was someone who was quite critical of libertarians, uh, Kirk was always a decentralist, and Kirk was always a regionalist, and he did not believe in these massive centralized government schemes like the New Deal. The neoconservatives, on the other hand, were quite willing to use centralized political power uh, in economics, and they certainly wanted to use it in foreign policy to prosecute the Cold War. Well, the neoconservatives wound up being the beneficiary of um, a little bit uh, too much uh, charity on the part of um, conservatives, uh, including traditionalists, that uh, a lot of traditionalists, a lot of conservatives during the Cold War, they welcomed the neoconservatives just because they thought, well, these are new converts who, um, you know, they're drifting in the right direction. Even if they're not quite there yet, these are nice allies to have. The neoconservatives often had some scholarly background in social science, which many of the traditionalists who had more of a background in literature and history uh, did not possess. So they saw the neoconservatives as being valuable as sociologists, for example, who studied crime, and uh, as being uh, people who had an expertise in the welfare state. They also thought the neoconservatives had a keen understanding of communism because many of them had been Trotskyists uh, themselves in their past. And they thought that the uh, neoconservatives were on the side of the angels when it came to opposing the new left's cultural radicalism. So a lot of traditionalist conservatives and other conservatives welcomed the neoconservatives into their coalition. The neoconservatives then stabbed them in the back. Uh, the neoconservatives were in a powerful position because they were given uh, you know, a sort of uh, free reign by the coalition they entered into with uh, the traditionalists and with uh, existing conservatives. While at the same time, the neoconservatives also were able to go to uh, Cold War Democrats and Cold War liberals and say, well, we're the kind of conservatives, neoconservatives, that you can do business with because we don't, we're not these radicals who want to dismantle the welfare state. Uh, we don't admire the Southern literary tradition. We're not, you know, sort of de classe like that. Basically, the, the neoconservatives went to, uh, you know, friends of theirs within the liberal community, and they said, uh, other conservatives are basically what Hillary Clinton would later call deplorables. And we neoconservatives are much more clubbable because again, we're on your side when it comes to things like the welfare state and the Cold War. We just don't like the very radical direction that the new left has taken. So the neoconservatives were able to get a certain amount of capital, moral capital, intellectual capital, uh, and also, of course, capital from philanthropy, from uh, major foundations, uh, coming from both uh, the right and from the left. They were seen as being, uh, by the left, as being the conservatives who were most uh, close to the left, and they were seen uh, by many conservatives as being uh, new converts who should be welcomed into the coalition. The neoconservatives uh, infiltrated the Ronald Reagan administration. This was a matter of uh, you know, tremendous internal controversy in the Reagan days. And uh, the neoconservatives wound up being so successful, not only in the Reagan administration, but especially in the George H.W. Bush administration subsequently, that uh, by the time you get to the end of the Cold War, the neoconservatives are in a position to uh, control most institutions in the conservative movement. And uh, they tolerate some of the old traditionalist conservatives, but they, uh, they don't tolerate many of them. They actually uh, tend to uh, try to exile and excommunicate um, a lot of traditional conservatives, a lot of you know, people who uh, had been uh, strong, even cold warriors. Uh, the neocons tried to excommunicate these conservatives as being uh, you know, racist or backward or uh, generally uh, you know, perhaps uh, anti-Semitic. This was a, 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 a charge that was labeled at, uh, leveled at Pat Buchanan, for example. Buchanan uh, had been a, um, a Cold War conservative. He was not someone who you know, was picking uh, fights with the neocons for no reason. But when the Cold War ended, Pat Buchanan said it's time to come home America, just as uh, George McGovern, who had been a hero to the new left, had said. And Buchanan said, uh, you know, it's time for us to uh, you know, start to unwind NATO, uh, to start to let Europe take care of its own security, and America should uh, return to the kind of foreign policy of non-intervention that we had followed before the World Wars, uh, and actually had followed before the um, Spanish-American War, which was really our, um, uh, you know, the... Uh, the time when we abandoned our traditional non-interventionism. So Buchanan uh, stood for non-interventionism, and uh, the, the question of non-interventionism got put to the test very soon after the end of the Cold War. In fact, even before the Soviet Union had collapsed in 1991, the United States went to war in the Persian Gulf. Uh, 
And uh, the Persian Gulf War was very divisive among uh, American conservatives. Most of them tended to support the Bush administration. This is George H.W. Bush. Uh, but Pat Buchanan and others were very critical and outspoken about uh, their opposition to the Persian Gulf War, which they thought would get us involved in the Persian Gulf War indefinitely, sorry, would get us involved in, in the Persian Gulf and in uh, you know, conflicts in the Middle East uh, endlessly. And of course, uh, Buchanan and others proved to be prophetic on that point. When uh, Pat Buchanan and uh, other traditionalist conservatives made this case back in the early 1990s, they were joined by principled libertarians, uh, such as uh, Murray Rothbard and Ron Paul and Lou Rockwell, um, who also said that our foreign policy, you know, which they had been very critical of during the Cold War, was uh, going even further off the rails in the post-Cold War era as we were becoming uh, a true empire, intervening, uh, becoming the world's policeman, uh, getting involved in the Middle East and so many other places. And so, um, ironically enough, a number of uh, you know, anarcho-capitalists, a number of very uh, strict individualists and libertarians, who perhaps had been an awkward fit with parts of the conservative movement during the Cold War era, either for foreign policy reasons or for reasons of uh, you know, thinking that uh, the Cold War conservative movement was too statist uh, in domestic policy. People like Murray Rothbard uh, looked at the political situation in the early 1990s, and they saw the need to form alliances and friendships with a number of these traditionalist conservatives who had now been exiled from the conservative movement by the neocons. Uh, these traditionalist conservatives who were opposed to uh, the, um, the Iraq war. These traditionalist conservatives were also outspoken critics of political correctness, which had become a major uh, phenomenon in the 1980s and early 1990s. And um, you tended to find that the neoconservatives and some of their uh, friends uh, in the Beltway who considered themselves to be libertarians, uh, that they took a softer line on questions of political correctness than either uh, anarcho-capitalists like Rothbard did or uh, uh, traditionalist conservatives like Pat Buchanan did. So political correctness and uh, the way in which America was um, descending into, you know, sort of uh, very high crime rates in the early 1990s, uh, which have really started to return uh, just recently. This was something that brought together uh, a number of libertarians as well as these traditionalist conservatives. And they formed an alliance of what came to be called paleoconservatism among the traditionalist conservatives. And uh, some of the libertarians uh, identified as paleolibertarians. So it was sort of a, a paleofusionism that took place in the early 1990s. And it was a powerful movement. Uh, Pat Buchanan's 1992 uh, effort for the Republican presidential nomination was unsuccessful, but it did uh, seriously wound George H.W. Bush. And it, it showed that George H.W. Bush uh, was not the invincible figure that he seemed to be at the height of the Persian Gulf War when his uh, approval ratings soared into the, 19, uh, soared, soared into the 90 uh, percent range. Uh, that in fact many Americans were very critical of uh, the agenda that uh, George H.W. Bush and the neoconservatives were pursuing uh, in the early 1990s. And uh, as uh, the 1996 uh, presidential campaign approached, uh, it seemed as if Pat Buchanan would have uh, an even better chance of getting the Republican uh, nomination or at least getting enough uh, uh, of a spotlight that he would be able to uh, shift the debate on the right away from neoconservatism and towards paleoconservatism. But a couple of tragedies struck around 1995 uh, and going into 1996. One of these, of course, in January of 1995 was the death of Murray Rothbard. And that was an, irre uh, an ir irreparable loss uh, because Rothbard's geniality, his uh, warmth as a human being, his, uh, you know, his mischievousness and uh, curiosity, these were qualities that made him the ideal person to uh, have interactions with sometimes quite prickly paleoconservatives that the uh, paleoconservatives were sometimes very much fixed in their uh, view of the world. They were very skeptical of libertarians whom they considered to be you know, perhaps uh, all crypto libertines or uh, people who were just uh, utilitarian economists and not people who had a really deep understanding and appreciation for the Western tradition. Murray Rothbard was able to form friendships even with the most skeptical of traditionalist conservatives and paleoconservatives. And so Rothbard was able to build a coalition and a, uh, a set of friends, which otherwise would have been impossible. So Rothbard's death was one uh, thing that co posed a, uh, a tremendous problem. It basically helped to unwind and break down what had been a, a promising uh, paleo coalition at that point. The other thing that happens is that Pat Buchanan in 1996 uh, focuses primarily on trade rather than foreign policy. And uh, on, on trade, uh, Pat Buchanan was an opponent, of course, of NAFTA, an opponent of free trade deals, and uh, generally a supporter of high tariffs and of industrial policy. 
all of which, of course, posed problems for the libertarian side of the Paleo Alliance. And, um, you know, paleo uh, libertarians uh, and strict uh, anarcho capitalist libertarians like Murray Rothbard, they were very critical of NAFTA too, uh, because they recognized that NAFTA was, in fact, a managed trade deal. It was a, you know, thousand page agreement with all kinds of regulations and international enforcement agreements and whatnot. And so there was a very strong libertarian case against these trade deals as well. But that was not the case that uh, Buchanan was making in 1995, 1996. And so uh, the uh, coalition of paleos started to unwind. And then, you know, worst of all, the neoconservatives got very lucky. So at a time when the neoconservatives have control of most of the conservative movement, uh, and they're starting to get funding from people like um, uh, the founder of Fox News, Rupert Murdoch, and you have, you know, at the beginning of Fox News, uh, a number of neoconservative figures who are brought on as, you know, experts and as spokespersons for conservatism. So people like Bill Kristol and his uh, friends at the Weekly Standard uh, were regular fixtures on Fox News in its first year or two. Uh, <coughs> its first, <coughs> excuse me, its first several years, in fact. Rupert Murdoch owned both the Weekly Standard and uh, um, uh, Fox News. And so as a result, it was quite natural for him to feature people from the magazine on his program. And I don't think Murdoch was keeping very close tabs on exactly what the ideological uh, lean of some of these outlets were. And as a result, uh, neoconservatism got hold of what would become by far the most influential mass platform of conservative communications uh, in the late 1990s. And, um, you know, neoconservatives also made uh, sure to cozy up to and flatter uh, Rush Limbaugh, so they got to have uh, a lot of uh, influence over the radio waves as well. In general, the, the neoconservatives, uh, at a time when they had uh, a death grip on the conservative movement, you also had a country which was uh, starting to experience a lot of technological prosperity. Uh, this was when uh, the internet first becomes a major consumer good. Uh, uh, there's a telecom revolution. You have, you know, cell phones becoming uh, common consumer products at this point. And uh, so America seems very prosperous. The neocons think that they have a, an unlimited line of credit with which to wage wars for the promotion of democracy and nation building all around the world. And uh, the neoconservatives also have tremendous financial resources. And uh, at the same time, this is all happening. The paleoconservatives and the libertarians who have been their allies are starting to have some tensions and uh, disputes among themselves. So the neocons basically rule the roost, and uh, they, uh, they have the very uh, delightful situation for themselves that in 2000, both of the major contenders for the Republican nomination are very uh, um, uh, compatible with neoconservative views. Those two candidates, of course, are George W. Bush and John McCain. And you can see how, you know, and there, again, there's a tragedy, tragedy that plays out here because with John McCain, the most outspoken neocon, and in fact, uh, a neocon who was quite happy to, uh, you know, say that he wanted to reach out to the left, with John McCain as the major challenger to George W. Bush, a lot of people who might otherwise have had reservations about Bush, a lot of conservatives who would have seen uh, George W. Bush as a chip off the George H.W. block tree. George H.W. Bush had raised taxes. He'd created the Americans with Disabilities Act. George H.W. Bush had been a disaster for limited government. He'd been a disaster, you know, straight down the line for conservatives. And of course, George H.W. Bush had also given us uh, some uh, quite unreliable Supreme Court justices. Um, not Clarence Thomas, but the other appointees by uh, George H.W. Were, um, were dreadful. Well, a number of conservatives who would otherwise have had reservations about George H.W. Bush's son were willing to give George W. Bush a, uh, uh, a blank check, or at least a, uh, they were willing to give him a chance because the alternative was John McCain. And so George W. Bush is able to get the Republican nomination in 2000. He chooses Dick Cheney as his running mate. Dick Cheney at the time was considered to be just a kind of um, rock-ribbed Republican. Uh, a lot of folks didn't really think of him as being a hardline ideological neocon. And uh, they should have looked more closely because there were already plenty of signs of that. And during the George W. Bush administration, we would see that in spades. Well, the neocons got lucky in terms of the political environment and the economic environment in the late 1990s. But uh, they wound up being the, cat, the, uh, the dog rather that uh, caught the car. So they get everything they want. They have full control of the conservative movement. They get a very sympathetic presidential administration in there. And as a result, they are able to pursue their policies both domestically and in foreign policy. And those policies, of course, turn out to be an absolute disaster. So George W. Bush following the neocon agenda, uh, not only does he respond to uh, the 9-11 attacks with a full-scale invasion and occupation, followed by nation building in Afghanistan, uh, 
But George W. Bush decides that he's going to do what the neocons have been calling for for years and years, really ever since the first Persian Gulf War. He's going to go and invade Iraq as well. Well, George W. Bush is able to start these wars, but he's not able to finish them. Uh, he's not able to establish peace or any kind of humane regime, uh, let, let alone a, a pro-American regime uh, that is stable in either Iraq or Afghanistan. And both of these become endless wars. They become wars that stretch on for a decade and more. And uh, they wind up producing situations that are, first of all, bloodbaths in the uh, immediate term, and then ultimately wind up with, you know, in the case of Afghanistan, the Taliban that we overthrew in 2001 simply come back as soon as America leaves, which shows that we accomplished absolutely nothing during our time there. Uh, and in Iraq, uh, you know, it's ironic because the neocons had always been uh, even more uh, hawkish against uh, Iran than they had against Iraq. But what we did in Iraq basically uh, made Iran stronger and it gave Iran more influence over Iraq. And you see that in some of the uh, headlines coming out of Iraq in the past month or so. So the neocons wound up being uh, quite discredited in foreign policy, that they started these wars that they couldn't finish. Uh, as a result, uh, the Republicans who had controlled Congress since 1995, uh, they lose control of Congress in the 2006 midterm elections. They lose the House of, of Representatives. And then, uh, of course, in 2008, uh, the, uh, uh, John McCain is nominated as the successor to George W. Bush, which he certainly was uh, spiritually in other respects. And McCain loses to Barack Obama. And Barack Obama, you know, was uh, a, a candidate with many deficiencies, but he did at least uh, claim to be against uh, the Iraq war, or at least uh, said he was against starting it. And that was quite uh, different from a lot of the other Democrats of that era. So uh, such Senate Democrats as Hillary Clinton and John Kerry, the 2004 presidential nominee, and of course Joe Biden were all supporters of the Iraq war uh, at the time. So the Democrats were not really an alternative to the Republicans, to the neocons at all uh, at that point. But in 2008, uh, you have Barack Obama claiming that he is going to be uh, a force of hope and change and that the page is going to be turned on this uh, neoconservative imperium uh, that had occurred in the whole country with the George W. Bush administration. And you also have an opening at this uh, point in 2008 for some of the critics of neoconservatism on the right to, to start regaining a popular audience and regaining traction. And uh, Ron Paul uh, heroically mounts a campaign for the 2008 Republican presidential nomination that year. And he is much more successful than any of the Beltway pundits and prognosticators had predicted. Uh, Ron Paul becomes a kind of grassroots phenomenon. His fundraising is astronomical. It's really fantastic. And uh, Ron Paul's message is clearly resonating. And it's clearly starting to bring in new people uh, to uh, uh, the liberty movement, certainly and also to the side of people who are uh, not on the left, people who are generally right of center and, and even personally quite conservative, uh, but who are very critical of the neocons and would like to see uh, you know, the George W. Bush legacy wiped out and just forgotten and completely repudiated. So Ron Paul is kind of uh, the, uh, uh, the prophet of a new populism that starts to emerge on the right. And uh, the Tea Party, which becomes very influential in the 2010 midterms and elects a number of Republicans to the Senate and the House, the Tea Party actually grows out of the Ron Paul movement in many ways. Not that the Tea Party follows a strict kind of constitutionalist, uh, libertarian Republican line like Ron Paul himself, but it does take inspiration from the grassroots energy that Ron Paul had been able to tap into. And so a number of other Republicans, many of whom, in fact, most of whom were far less principled, were able to try to brand themselves as candidates for liberty. And uh, they were able then to uh, you know, uh, take advantage of this Tea Party wave in 2010 and get elected. Of course, the neocons had been a disaster not only in foreign policy, but also in domestic policy. And the George W. Bush administration led us into the Great Recession. The Great Recession was also very discrediting of uh, neoconservative views on economics and on domestic policy. And so there, too, there was an opening for people like Ron Paul and for critics of a loose monetary policy to gain a new audience. And Ron Paul runs again in 2012 because the Republican Party at that point still has not learned its lesson. And the 2012 Republican nominee is, is uh, Mitt Romney, of course. And Romney is a chip off the old George W. Bush and uh, John McCain block. Um, there's a, a limit to how much, however, uh, support Ron Paul is able to garner within the Republican Party. A lot of Republicans and a lot of conservatives still think that uh, libertarianism means... Um, you know, uh, support for drug legalization and maybe support for things like gay marriage, which a number of uh, Beltway libertarians in particular were very outspoken in support of. 
Uh, a lot of social conservatives really thought that libertarians could not be their allies. And even though Ron Paul was quite socially conservative, and Ron Paul, of course, was an obstetrician who opposed abortion because he knew that abortion was the termination of a life in the womb, um, despite that, a number of social conservatives were still very skeptical of Ron Paul, did not want to join his coalition, and uh, as a result, there was a, a ceiling to how much support Ron Paul could find in 2008 and in 2012. Well, in uh, 2016, uh, Ron Paul's son, Senator Rand Paul, is uh, looking to build a somewhat wider coalition. Uh, but for a variety of reasons, some of them being, uh, you know, just in terms of personality, Rand Paul is not quite, uh, you know, the kind of uh, prophetic figure uh, that his father was. For a number of reasons, uh, Rand Paul is not successful in creating a broader sort of uh, populist liberty movement uh, on the right. Uh, a large, uh, you know, reason for uh, the failure of libertarian populism to emerge in 2016 is that a different kind of populism emerges with Donald Trump. And Donald Trump is not a, you know, a, a, a tutored ideologue. He's not someone who knows a great deal of conservative philosophy necessarily, but he's someone whose instincts have always been quite paleoconservative, at least when it comes to issues such as immigration uh, and of course trade, uh, but also foreign policy. And uh, Donald Trump you know, was outspoken in denouncing uh, George W. Bush and John McCain and the Iraq war. And so Trump was able to capitalize in an even bigger way than Ron Paul had on uh, the disgust that many Americans and especially conservatives felt with the way in which uh, the country had gone under the leadership of George W. Bush. And I should point out, by the way, a lot of conservatives, a lot of you know, sort of ordinary Republicans, they didn't necessarily think of themselves as being anti-war or against the Iraq war, but they just looked at the result and they said, something is wrong here. And maybe we can't even uh, bring ourselves to say what went wrong, but clearly uh, we're ashamed of the results here. Uh, we really feel as if something uh, you know, has betrayed our own soldiers. Uh, we have failed to live up to the promise that we thought we were offering uh, the people of Iraq. When uh, Donald Trump ran for office, and indeed when uh, Ron Paul had run, uh, they were able to articulate these frustrations that many conservatives felt, uh, but could not bring themselves to consciously articulate. And uh, so Donald Trump uh, cleared the way to a kind of rethink on the American right. The neoconservatives had previously been able to co-opt a lot of Christian conservatives. So in the 1980s and 1990s and 2000s, you found that uh, neocon friendly uh, Catholic thinkers such as Richard John Newhouse at First Things Magazine and uh, Michael Novak, uh, that they were very influential in shaping the direction of Catholic conservative thought uh, during those three decades. And uh, you had a number of, um, you know, sort of beltway libertarians and free market think tanks that uh, also were able, uh, you know, were quite willing to do business with the neoconservatives. They thought, well, we have some reservations about neocon foreign policy, but we really like the, uh, you know, sort of uh, rather more liberal approach to uh, immigration and, uh, you know, somewhat open borders that uh, neoconservatives seem to be much more uh, amenable to than paleoconservatives. Paleoconservatives were always on the side of restricting immigration and closing the borders. And uh, the neoconservatives also posed as you know, free traders. They were in support of things like NAFTA. And now you see that old uh, neoconservatives like Jonah Goldberg, for example, and uh, for that matter, I think even Bill Kristol, that they have rebranded themselves. They've decided, aha, um, what we actually are are, are um, classical liberals. So again, this label, which had been you know, co-opted by uh, the likes of FDR and Woodrow Wilson at one point, uh, is now being uh, claimed by the likes of Bill Kristol. And labeling always becomes very difficult for these reasons. So that is how they are framing themselves these days. On the right, however, there's now um, a bit of a vacuum and a lot of discussion as to uh, where uh, conservatism should go. And uh, a lot of the institutions that previously had been willing to uh, play ball with the neocons are starting to try to rethink radical alternatives now. So that's why you find among Catholic conservatives a re-examination of some of the ideas of people like Brent Bozell when it comes to the idea of having a uh, explicitly Catholic state. And uh, very few, you know, sort of beltway institutions or conservative magazines are adopting a, a view as, as hardline as that. But there are a number of influential thinkers, um, folks perhaps uh, like Saurabh Amari, uh, Patrick Deneen and others, who um, certainly in principle would, would adopt that kind of approach to the relationship between uh, the church and the state as opposed to a, uh, a more liberal view or a, a disconnected view that was uh, characteristic of uh, conservatism up until now. You also have a change among uh, a group that is called the West Coast Straussians, and they are identified uh, with the Claremont Institute out in California. 
Now, the Claremont Institute always had some differences with uh, the neoconservatives. The Claremont Institute, their guiding light was uh, Harry Jaffa. Harry Jaffa was uh, a very bold and cantankerous uh, philosopher. And so he had feuds with almost everyone. He had feuds with libertarians. He had feuds with uh, traditional conservatives like Russell Kirk uh, and uh, Mel Bradford in particular, a Southern conservative. And uh, Harry Jaffa also had feuds with other Straussians, uh, people like Harvey Mansfield, for example. Um, but in general, the um, West Coast Straussians were able to get along to some degree uh, with, the ne with the neocon dominated uh, American right of the 1980s and 1990s. And uh, the, the, uh, because of their uh, connection to Harry Jaffa, Jaffa was a great admirer of Abraham Lincoln. Uh, generally, West Coast Straussians are strong critics of the idea of secessionism, uh, and they like the idea of uh, the Declaration of Independence and its universal values. Uh, they, um, so they like to draw a distinction between uh, you know, the uh, American War of Independence and the claims to independence that were made by the American South in the Civil War. What's happened, though, is that um, the uh, West Coast Straussians have seen the failures of neoconservatism. They've seen the emergence of yet another, even more radical form of the new left with wokeism and uh, with the BLM movement and other, th other such things. And um, the uh, West Coast Straussians have also kind of re-examined the idea of secession, not because they're re-examining Lincoln or the Civil War, but because I think they've reminded themselves that the Declaration of Independence itself was about breaking away from an empire, breaking away from a larger political unit that uh, was no longer representative of uh, the Americans uh, in their own communities. So West Coast Straussians have now become uh, you know, quite strong allies of populist conservatism and uh, quite strong allies of uh, various critics of the neocons. You know, I, I count uh, many West Coast Straussians as very close friends. So the West Coast Straussians are, I think, a group that um, libertarians who previously had had strong uh, you know, disagreements with them, they still have well, principal disagreements over Lincoln and the Civil War and uh, certain issues of philosophy. But uh, even in many practical uh, issues, there's now a crossover that had not been there before. So where do libertarians fit into uh, this new evolving American right? Well, unfortunately, a lot of libertarians uh, in Washington, D.C., and in positions of influence to the extent that any libertarian had any influence, um, they were always trying to cozy up, you know, first to uh, the neoconservatives. Subsequently, they tried to say, well, we can be kind of woke too. We don't like, you know, woke statism maybe, but we want to have kind of a free market wokeness or something. Uh, the, um, this, this was how you know, these folks branded themselves. They were always going out there and promoting these left-wing ideas. Uh, they uh, adopted uh, you know, uh, the camouflage, and in some cases, actually the principles of the woke left and uh, to some degree the neocon neocons as well. Well, they've been totally discredited, and we've seen that uh, that brand of libertarianism is so unpopular that it has even been repudiated uh, forcefully by the Libertarian Party itself, which is now uh, under the control of libertarians who are rather right-leaning in their cultural views. Uh, the, uh, I believe it was the Mises Caucus that took control of uh, the uh, Libertarian Party. No official connection with the Mises Institute, of course, but uh, they both look to the intransigent libertarianism of Mises as an inspiration, rather than the more compromising libertarianism, perhaps, of other figures. So I think uh, within uh, libertarianism itself, you see a lot of the older libertarian uh, institutions in the Beltway and elsewhere uh, weakened, discredited, in the same position as many of the neocon institutions are. And you see a lot of grassroots libertarians who are hunger for an alternative. They want an alternative to uh, the Gary Johnsons and the uh, Bill Bars and the other sort of hopeless, washed up Republicans uh, that were characteristic of the Libertarian Party's nominations uh, for a good long time there. Speaking of time, we are almost at uh, my limit, so I'm just going to wrap up here. But it seems to me that um, while there are strong philosophical points of disagreement between populist libertarians, between, uh, you know, sort of... Um, strict, uh, you know, sort of Rothbardian libertarians uh, and people like, uh, you know, our integralist friends, Saurabh Amari and others, and uh, some of the West Coast Straussians, people like Michael Anton, for example, even though there are strong philosophical uh, points of divergence and, uh, you know, and sometimes clashes of personality as well, I think all of us need to recognize uh, the tremendous danger that is posed to us right now by a newly aggressive left. Uh, it's an aggressive left that is not only statist, but also it has adopted basically one of the two general totalitarian strategies 
So the totalitarian strategy that was often ad ad adopted by the left in the 20th century was the communist strategy of well, let's try to make the state uh, in control of everything directly. Let's nationalize industry. Let's pursue you know, the goals of communism. That was sort of the most radical form of, of leftism uh, in much of the 20th century. The leftism that's most radical now is actually following the strategy of the other totalitarian power of fascism and Nazism in that uh, just as the Nazis didn't necessarily nationalize every industry, instead the Nazis would go to private businesses and say, hmm, you might want to no longer hire Jews in your company and you might want to you know, manufacture munitions for us and you might want to uh, create barbed wire for us. Basically the Nazis were able to co-opt a lot of private actors uh, and to coerce them indirectly in, or, and in some cases directly as well into serving the Nazi ideology. Now, I'm not saying that there's a direct comparison between Nazism and, and leftism today, but you'll see that leftism is doing exactly the same thing in terms of trying to um, uh, you know, uh, extort uh, private sector in institutions into following a left-wing ideological line. And that's important because, as we know, the state is monstrously incompetent. So the one good thing you can say about the old status left is that if it actually got what it wanted, it created all these new bureaucracies, they were incompetent. And people very quickly saw they didn't work. The Soviet Union you know, was something that uh, very quickly uh, was not something idealists could support, even if they were Marxists, because they realized this thing is a total failure in every respect. Uh, the new left, that, uh, you know, the, the woke left of today, unfortunately, is trying to co-opt much more competent allies in the private sector. In corporate America, through things like ESG, which I know we'll have a session about later today. And of course, the left has already completely overrun our institutions of higher education. So this is, this is a real existential danger, uh, not in the sense that we're going to be put in gulags or what have you, but in the sense that uh, the very ideas of liberty that Frank Chodorov said must be preserved if we're going to have freedom in this country are now being eradicated uh, by social networks that are, that are obeying uh, left-wing dictates, and uh, they are being strangled and, and you know, sort of eradicated in our universities as well, and certainly in the press, in the, in the mainstream media. Uh, this is a situation that is dire for traditionalists, for Christian conservatives, and for serious libertarians. And so there is certainly a need for these groups to have good conversations among one another, not because conversation can solve every problem, but rather because we want to form friendships with people who realize just how diabolical today's left is and the need for all of us to work together to oppose it. Thank you very much.